open to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 4. Uh, Jesus was addressing end times. He was talking about the future. And as Jesus talked about the future, he said some very interesting descriptive words of what the future will look like. And it says this in, in Matthew 24. Actually, I'll start in verse 3. He sat on the Mount of, the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him and said, When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. It's going to be a very difficult time, a very deceptive time, uh, religiously, politically, and everything. This is what he said. Many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ. They will deceive many. Do you remember the people that put plastic bags over their head and killed themselves in California, the mass suicide to catch the hale Bop comet going by? That was a messianic deal. They were going to heaven. Uh, that's an example of this. I mean, that's something that just happened. Uh, this deception and people saying they're the Christ. Look at verse 6. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, see that you're not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. That's because that's going to be the trigger at the front end of the tribulation hour, and the end of it doesn't happen until the seven-year period goes by, and there's much, and we'll see that tonight. Look at verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, ethne against ethne. What's in the news now? Kosovo, the ethnic Albanians being exterminated by the ethnic Serbs, and, and that constant conflict. That's what this is talking about. Never before in history have there been such emphasis upon people's ethnicity. When I was little, we were all Americans. Now we're no longer Americans. We are, we're hyphenating, we're this American, that American, that American, that American. And the front end is more important than the American part sometimes. And it's this ethnic revival. Everybody is, is going back to, to identify themselves by an ethnic designation. And exactly what the Bible said, there will be ethne against ethne, ethnic group against ethnic group. Now it used to be empires were against little groups and they were squelching them and, and knocking them out. Now we're going to have small little factions fighting themselves and that's what's going on all over the world right now more than ever. That's not all. Uh, there, there will be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that's the big, the more global thing. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. And this is just the beginning of sorrows. Let me just show you a few headlines, okay? Um, let's see if it comes on. Uh, this is just a cover of the Newsweek. Do you remember not too many weeks ago, the big deal with, with India and Pakistan? That's an ethnic rivalry. And do you remember that Pakistan uh, detonated their five atomic bombs to show, or their, their uh, underground sites to show that they were paramount with, with India, and they said, we don't want anybody to, to have any doubts about whether or not the Muslim world has the bomb. By the way, that's the first time the Muslims have had atomic bombs. And the Pakistanis are very, very interested in sharing that information. And many people that follow this believe it won't be long until the uh, Iranians and everybody else has it. Now, this is this week's. Uh, I think this is interesting. China's uh, arms race. Fascinating uh, what it says here. Uh, Beijing's buying spree. You probably can't read it. I'll read it for you. Uh, they have a no, new global reach. Do you know the Bible talks about the kings of the east coming and fighting the, the Antichrist and, and he, coming into that great conflagration at Armageddon. The, all the nations converge on the Antichrist headquarters in Jerusalem, which is actually a, a, a big, big conflagration to try and destroy the Jews. It's at the end of the tribulation. People have laughed. Uh, in fact, the, the front article of this says that China has been an antiquated kind of ag agronomic or um, agricultural community, and now they are becoming a global superpower. How? Well, they've developed ICBMs here. Uh, they've purchased Russia's best supersonic planes. In fact, they've, they've licensed the reproduction of them. They can build them now at home, and they're building them 150 at a time. Uh, they have, through technology, uh, gotten these satellites. They are buying submarines as fast as they can. They have bought the best helicopters from Europe and France, who has a tremendous aerospace program, and they have licensed the production of them, limitless numbers of them, in China. And they, of course, soon will have the largest standing army in the world. We're going to see that tonight. We're going to see the convergence tonight of hundreds of millions of soldiers into one area, and we'll look at it on the map as it happens. Um, Something else. I mean, look back at Matthew 24. What does it say? 
uh, nation will rise against nation. Uh, there will be famines, uh, pestilence. Let's talk about famines. This is this week, too. Did any of you see the article on suicide seeds? Genetically now, they have pulled out the little slice in the DNA coil that causes a seed to become sterile and non-reproducible. And Monsanto, this, this uh, biotech uh, mega company, has worked that into all their most profitable seeds. And so those seeds, as soon as they ripen, they immediately sterilize themselves so they can never be reproduced. So you can collect all the seeds you want to the end of your life and they'll never grow. And they're doing this now successively on every crop that they produce. It used to be only special seeds. Only American farmers had this problem with their hybrid this and that. They're now doing that with rice. They're doing that with every type of food crop in the world. You know what this article says? It says there's a growing fear around the world that somehow the pollen, when it spreads out with this genetically altered thing, will somehow go into other plants. And through the mystery of, of how uh, God has designed plants in, in their whole uh, system of, of reproduction, that it would be possible for this gene to replicate. And it says they can see the growing decimation of all green plants on the earth. What does Revelation say? It says a third to half of all plants die. You know, we've always said, oh, atomic bombs burn them up. Well, you know what? Our technology in America is producing suicide seeds now to kill off and to genetically alter, and uh, there's a great big backlash against that. You know what else is going on? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. We'll get this. The flu hunters. Um, look at this. It says, kingdom will rise against kingdom. There will be famines, suicide seeds, pestilences. Let me give you a 30-second flu story. If you read this, you ought to read it in Time Magazine. It, it'll make you stay awake tonight. It says that, that, that the worst and most deadly flus are all carried by avian flus. Their birds have flus, ducks primarily. And ducks swim in ponds. And ducks, when they swim in the ponds, they leave little messes behind. And the, in China, the pigs come in and they swim in the ponds and play around the ponds and drink the water in the ponds. And in their throats, they have two sets of cells in their throats. And they have the ability to replicate avian flu viruses across into the swine, which is communicable to humans. That's why you always hear about the Asian flus, you know, and oh boy, it's going to be a bad flu. Well, this whole article talks about the fact that last Christmas in Hong Kong, you remember the Hong Kong chicken flu that they got scared and they killed all the chickens real quick? They found that was the exact same strain that killed tens of millions of people in the global flu epidemic of 1918 in that era when 20, 30, 40 million people died of the flu. They died of the flu. They called it influenza. It was the flu. And these flu hunters from the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization said that now there are globally killing flu strains that have developed. And they said that there is not the technical capacity to, build an, or to produce enough vaccine fast enough to stop it. Uh, this article, which when we get to that point where I talk about the sealed judgments in a few weeks, I'm actually going to show you. Um, their, their findings. They went to Alaska and dug up the bodies of World War I soldiers that were stationed in, in Alaska during World War I who died of this influenza outbreak. It was so catastrophic. They just put mass graves in, put a hundred people in a grave and put the tundra over them and they were frozen so well that they were able to just exhume them and go through genetically and look at them and they found that the flu of Hong Kong of 1997 was exactly the flu that killed tens of millions in 1918. Fascinating. Keeps us awake. Well, it doesn't just say that. It says, nation will rise against nation. Remember all the stuff going on in Jakarta? Uh, hey, you read the paper? The Serbs are still defiant. I mean, they will do whatever it takes. Do you remember 1991? Uh, the tinderbox, the Iraqi missiles hit Israel. Uh, widened or a wider Gulf War feared. Remember, the world atomic arsenals are uh, United States and Russia, and then you get France and, and China and Britain in there. And right after that is Israel. They have the most warheads, and they're very willing to share them in times of need. You know what else the Bible says? I like this. The Powerball, do you remember that when it reached 100 million? Do you know what else the Bible describes the end of the days as? For people will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be lovers of money. I mean, look at our, I can't bring in all the headlines. I mean, there was that one headline, is any athlete worth $112 million? 
That's a good question. You know what else it says? It says that there will be people murdering themselves. Look at that. Homicide record set in 22 cities. I mean, uh, this article was fascinating. It just shared what happened in one day in America. All the people that were murdered and how gruesome. Uh, do you remember this headline? Killer heat. Tops. 200 dead. And that was, just, that was just here in America. We're not talking about what goes on in India and everywhere else. Uh, it also says the religious deception. Look at this. The popularity of Virgin Mary is resurging. Mary is now showing up not just in uh, Medjugorje over in, in Yugoslavia. She's showing up everywhere now. There's an oak tree in Carmel, California, where she regularly meets, and tens of thousands of people come there. There are fields out. Uh, you've heard about that one in Texas. They had 100,000 people there, and Mary appeared to them. Uh, she's appearing in, in spots all over the world. And this whole resurgence, um, this whole resurgence of Mariolatry is, is uh, a part of the end days because her message, every time she shows up, is the same. She says, peace, global peace, and we should all unite. And that's the message of the Antichrist. Have you noticed how much uh, Satanism is coming back? Another headline, right, in the Tulsa world, did you see that at, at Halloween? It talks about the growing return to the natural earth god worship, which we know who the god of this earth is. Uh, I mentioned the, the pestilences. Uh, USA Today had an article about this, biochemical. I mean, isn't that a great site? This is the, the American response team to the chemical weapons. Now we are getting ready for a terrorist attack. It's not just Clancy novels anymore. They are expecting anthrax, botulism, and all the others to be soon. Really, I mean, there have been a lot of scares, and no one's actually done it yet, but the U.S. government is now preparing for biochemical warfare. Who needs an atomic bomb when anthrax, if Berlin had been attacked with anthrax in World War II, there would not be a single living person still in Berlin today. It lasts for 50 to 75 years. You cannot inhabit the area where it doesn't go away. It keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. That is worse than atomic weaponry. We're so afraid of atomic bombs. Uh, look at this, this Japanese sect, the raid, do you remember that, the Tokyo subway where they're spraying and killing all those people and all that and the close crammed in subway system? Deadly bacteria. They were growing it, cultivating it. Remember, it only takes $12,000 in a modern-sized bedroom to, to start a biochemical warfare division with biotechnology. $12,000, and you can buy it on the Internet today. And by the way, all the things you need to do it, you can find on the Internet, too. Explains everything. Do you remember Ebola? Uh, the, the horrible outbreak of this virus, and there is no way to stop it. There's no known cure. Again, if... Uh, one of these bioterrorists could get that. Uh, it literally says this disease, which causes fever and death and massive bleeding in up to 90% of the cases, remains a mystery. We don't even understand how it does it. This is the top biomedical scientist. And in the midst of all that, another thing that the Bible talks about, and we'll get to when we, when we go through the footnotes of chapter 6, is it talks about the fact that there's going to be an incredible loss of wealth during the tribulation hour. I thought this headline was great. A year's gain gone. Do you remember that day when the Dow only fell 513 points? And when in just one second, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars were gone? Think about this. The wealth of our world right now is not real wealth. It's electronic wealth. It's just decimal points and zeros. People, 100 years ago, they owned factories. If you look at any of the Internet stocks, you can look at Procter & Gamble or, or colgate Palmolive or any of those companies next to an eBuy or a Yahoo, and, and the, the manufacturing company will have fixed assets. They will have plants, and, and they will have manufacturing equipment. They will own real estate. They will have systems. They will have products. They will have assembly lines. What is Yahoo? It's a thought. It's a computer-generated world uh, of electronic commerce but, and news and everything else, but, but there's no comparison anymore to the old wealth, which was land and stuff, and the new wealth, which is just ideas. Uh, remember a while back we were wondering if Japan could recover? We're going to see tonight they recover and, and they're going to be part of the Army of the East. And heading all that, do you remember this headline? This was in the Sunday paper uh, in February, a United States of Europe. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, and it gives the whole history from 92 on. And the United States of Europe makes peace with Israel. Do you remember these great headlines giving peace a chance uh, when Clinton orchestrated this this 
propose peace. Well, the, the Antichrist is going to give a big peace, and he's going to actually let the Jews rebuild their temple on the temple mount. Now, that's going to be a miracle. Um, and all that's going to be because there's going to be this united Europe, which we're, it's happening right now. I mean, this, is, uh, this was a while back. This was in, uh, a few years ago. It's happened. There's a single market now. There's a single currency. It's in effect right now. They're doing transactions in the euro. And there's going to rise one man who's going to unite all of those countries and more. And it's not just uh, Europe. All of that, and we're not afraid because, do you remember, uh, this of course was eight years ago, when uh, Gorbachev resigned and the Soviet Union no longer exists? Well, it really does, but not like it did. And all that coming together. Well, what is going to happen, as we're going to see tonight, the epicenter of God's redemptive plan is on Jerusalem. And what happens in Jerusalem will radiate out like a magnitude uh, 9 on the Richter scale earthquake to this planet. And that's where we are in chapter 16. If you want to start turning there to chapter 16 um, of Revelation, let me introduce Armageddon, and then uh, we will go through this incredible event. Revelation 16, in just a few moments we'll read our text tonight, 12 through 16. Armageddon, on your notes, these words are found, is the word describing what the world will be like without Jesus. Mankind's unending fight with God at last brings them the freedom they've always wanted, life without God. You know, that's what our world really wants. Get away from God. We, we, through evolution and everything else, we don't want God. We don't want a judge. We don't want a creator. We don't want someone meddling with our lives. We want to live our own way. Well, the time has come for the fighting of that final war of the age, the name which has become a byword among men since John first wrote it down, Armageddon. God has chosen the Holy Land as the stage upon which two crucial events take place. One on a mountain, one on a plain. Mount Calvary and the plain of Megiddo are the two altars of sacrifice that dominate the history of this world. The Holy Spirit of God has chosen five capable authors to describe for us in clear chilling language that most famous of all battles Armageddon and pretty soon I'm going to read for you uh, from David Isaiah Joel Zechariah and John and those five authors tell us what's going to happen at Armageddon and it is overwhelming just the sheer magnitude and, and we'll look at that and I'll show you some maps so you see where everybody's coming from but what is life like apart from Jesus that's what the rest of the 16th chapter is about, and I hope that you kind of get interested in it and you read the rest. Life apart from Jesus without his power is reduced to a living hell. And that's why people need so many substances to make it through life. If you push God out of the picture, all you're left with is getting ready for life without God. The ultimate life without God is hell. And hell on earth is shown in the 16th chapter. The plagues on the earth, that's the first couple verses of... of uh, uh, chapter 16, when people have sores all over their bodies as, as they start corrupting, uh, their bodies actually start oozing with these horrible plague-like sores. Then the pollution of the seas as the sea is filled with death. And then the poison on the land as all the streams of water uh, get, get ruined. That's the uh, 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 third bowl in verses 4 down to 7. The fourth bowl, the sun heats up. Remember that headline, 200 people killed by the heat wave? It's going to be millions killed by the heat wave. Uh, those who started with sun worship back in the old days are now going to be powerless before the creator of the sun who burns them with the sun. Um, then our text is in verse 12, and that is the waters of the great dividing river Euphrates are dried up, and a demon trio rounds up the armies of the Antichrist and of the world, and Armageddon is their destination. And then the chapter concludes with verses 17 to 21, talking about the biggest earthquake ever on the planet. And I think it's fascinating, if you study all this, that scientists have narrowed down that there have been 5,319 earthquakes in recorded history, actually since 1100 A.D., when they really paid attention to them, and historians wrote them down. What the Lord said is that they were going to be uh, increasing. Well, that's interesting, because they are. Uh, if, you, if you look at the counts, you can't say our instruments are getting more sensitive, because really we're using the same technology we've used for the last 100 years. And if you look at just the last 100 years, Earthquakes are growing exponentially. 1899, 172, uh, from, from uh, 1850 to 1899, from 1900 to 1949, there were three times as many, 506, 
And just in the last 47 years, there are 670. And we're not even to the end of the century, and that's not counting the quakes in 1998. And I have some incredible headlines uh, to show you when we get to earthquakes. Do you remember the quake in Japan? I mean, that, that hit a city of 1.4 million and devastated it incredibly uh, just a few years ago. Well, our text, Revelation 16, and let's, starting in verse 12, down through 16, read and ask for the Lord to apply the battle of Armageddon to our hearts and our spiritual lives. Verse 12, chapter 16, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its, waters was dry, its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Isn't it interesting that all these science fiction movies when they portray these monsters, they're reptilian, like, like this. Very interesting. The science fiction people, either they're reading the Bible or they're getting their signals from the devil. I mean, I'm not sure which it is, but, you know, they're doing it, what it says. These reptilian creatures, and that's what these demons are like. Uh, three unclean, these amphibian frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. This is the unholy trinity copying the Holy Trinity of God. These are, these are spirits of demons performing signs. God says, always watch out for people doing signs and wonders. And what is the whole church going after now? Signs and wonders. He says, beware of signs and wonders. That's not God's realm. Only during specific periods of time. And he says, watch out for the deception of signs and wonders. And through these signs, they go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, and they gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, who keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place in Hebrew called Har Mageddon. Armageddon, as we call it. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray tonight that as we look into your word at this battle to end all battles as we look at how the world human history ends before your intervention your second coming I pray that we would derive the lessons you have put here for us because we know the purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal you Lord Jesus and so I pray that tonight you would be revealed in all of your glory and may we not focus so much on the carnage and the destruction and the geography as upon the beauty that you display to us, Lord Jesus, in all of your glory. Quicken our minds, help us to understand your word as we bow before you, asking for you to open our eyes and behold wonderful things from this, your book of books. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to remind you what I said earlier. These verses tell us that the stage upon which the final act of human history is to be played out is the stage that the greatest act of human history occurred in. On the same piece of geography, the greatest offering of all time, the offering of Christ on Mount Calvary, on the hill of Moriah, occurred. And in the center of Armageddon is going to be the city of Jerusalem. You'll see in just a moment. Mount Calvary and Megiddo, Armageddon, are the two altars of sacrifice that will dominate the history of this planet. The Holy Spirit, through the Old Testament prophets, described that event. And if you'd like to come with me, let's look at them. I'll read them to you. Psalm 2. And uh, we'll be reading in order, starting in Psalms. So if you're not sure where Psalms are, just open your Bible. You'll probably hit it in the middle. And then find the second Psalm. And I'm going to be reading these verses uh, that are listed here in your study notes. Psalm 2, why did the nations rage? Verse 1, and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, this is somewhat talking about general rebellion against God, but specifically it's talking about the ultimate rebellion which we're looking at tonight. This is what God does. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. At the end there, verse 9, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Armageddon. Look at Isaiah 34. It goes Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah 34. You just go to the right and you'll run into Isaiah. It's a big book, 66 chapters. It's a little microcosm 
of the whole Bible. It has the same division as the Bible does. The first 39 chapters are like the Old Testament, doom and gloom, and the last 27 chapters are like the New Testament, full of hope and a future. But Isaiah 34, in the gloom and doom section, the first 39 chapters, the first six verses say this. And uh, this is what's fascinating because this is when we're going to start seeing the uh, uh, geography of the, the whole uh, event. And I'll get this ready so that I can explain to you. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of this doesn't mean anything to us because we, we can't figure out what all these words mean in Hebrew. But look at Isaiah 34. Come near, ye nations, to hear. Hearken, ye peoples, let the earth hear. And all that is therein, the world, and the things that come forth from it. From the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, for his fury is on their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to slaughter. And we're talking about complete slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and the stench shall come up out of their carcasses. Very graphic. The mountains shall be melted with their blood, and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens will be rolled together as a scroll. And their host shall fall down, and as a leaf falleth off from a vine, and the falling fig from the fig tree, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edom. Oh, now we have some geography here. And um, I, I forgot how I make this better, but you can kind of get the idea. Edom is this part right here. And we're going to see in just a second Basra, or uh, uh, yeah, Basra, and uh, uh, Basra is, whoop. It's off the map. It's right there. There's Basra. There's Edom. Edom is this whole area down Moab, and then Moab stops here, and Edom starts. There's Edom. There's Basra, which we're going to see in just a minute, and Megiddo is right there. This, by the way, is the uh, coastline, Mediterranean. This is Israel and Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea, uh, Sinai down here, Jordan, where uh, the king just died right there, and up there is Syria. And Lebanon's right there. So Armageddon is, is not just a lot of people say, oh, how can you get hundreds of millions of people right there? No, the battleground extends for 200 miles, this whole, way down here, all the way up here. And what's right in the center? Right there. The name is there, but there's where it is. This is Jerusalem, dead center. Uh, it's the epicenter of the whole conflict. Okay, keep reading here. Um, upon Edom... And upon the people of my curse, remember there's Edom, and the judgment, and the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It's made fat with fatness, the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. You know, I mean, that's just, just to talk about how gruesome. It's talking about total destruction. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra. But Basra, down there, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Now turn to Isaiah 63, to the right again. Let's keep reading about this. And, and for some of you, I hope you get a little bit uh, excited about the fact that, that the Bible is talking about places that are here right now. It's talking about events right now. The kings of the East are arming themselves right now. Red China watched on CNN the Gulf War, and the generals of Red China said, we are not going to get out of this. Uh, I mean, we're not going to, to be left behind. We're going to get into this high-tech warfare. And they launched, and if you read the article in Time uh, Magazine this week, they said they launched their spies out, and they said, we are going to catch up, and the kings of the east are not going to be unarmed. And so we have now the 1.2 billion people, the largest economy in the world, potentially, is ready to arm themselves to the teeth, and they are a piece in God's prophetic plan. Isaiah 63 says this. I'll read verses 3, 4, and 6. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. I have trodden the winepress alone, and the peoples there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled on my garments. Do you understand the idea of a, of a wine press? is they had this um, kind of a vat, uh, like walls around, like a swimming pool, full of grapes, and you would jump up and down on it. And that's how they made wine. And it would squeeze them out, and there was a pipe that would take the, the squeezed juice out, put it in a vat, it would settle... The, the dregs, which is the, the stuff that settles out, the impurities, would fall to the bottom, and they would take off the wine, and they let it settle again, and they would just keep moving it from vessel to vessel. But the idea is the person jumping up and down in the grapes, it would splash up on them. And what God says here, that when Jesus Christ comes in his fury, see, people that are called liberals, theologically speaking, say the God of the Old Testament, so look at him doing this. But the God of the New Testament is meek and mild. And, you know, he holds children on his lap, Jesus. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, and he is holding back his wrath until a day and an hour that he is appointed 
when he's going to intersect with this planet and do these things. Keep reading. For the day of my vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come, and I will tread down the peoples in my anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Now, keep going to the right, to the book of Joel. Gets more graphic. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. There we go. Joel, chapter 3. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Chapter 3, I'm going to read 2 and then 9 to 16. I will gather all nations. I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This valley right here is Kidron, which is also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat because it meets right here with the Hinnom Valley below the city on the south side of Jerusalem. This valley, Jerusalem's up on a hill, a, a plateau, 2,500 feet high. And down here, this southern valley is Hinnom. This is Kidron Valley. And where they meet right here, is it, it starts being called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So what does it say there? It says, I will bring them down, verse 2, into the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is right here. Now you say, what is that? Well, if you look back here, the center of the whole conflict is Jerusalem. It's the center of Armageddon. Armageddon is not just Megiddo. That's the beginning of it, the Valley of Jezreel. It goes all the way to Basra. It's, it's uh, this long battlefield. Altogether, if you go to the very end of, of Edom, it's 200 miles long. And dead center in it is Jerusalem. And the epicenter of what God's doing, as, as I mentioned to you, the epicenter is uh, Jerusalem. It's this, the bullseye of what God is doing. That's why I, I love this graphic that, that everything God is focusing, his redemptive plan right there on the Valley of Jehoshaphat, right outside the walls of Jerusalem. Keep reading, verse 2. And I will judge them there. For my people, for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now look at verse 9. I'll read from 9 to 16. Proclaim them among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come. Beat your plowshares into sword. What's the motto of the UN? Beat your swords into plowshares. Well, God says it's time to beat them back, okay? Make weaponry. It's time to go to war. Your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye nations. Remember, Armageddon is different than what we're going to study in the future. I personally believe we could see Russia invade Israel while we Christians are still on earth. There's nothing to prevent Russia from invading Israel. It's, it's not part of the plan. It's, that invasion has always been uh, disputed among scholars. They can never figure out. I, I mean, every chart you look at, it's in a different spot. It's at the end. It's in the middle of the tribulation. It's at the beginning of the tribulation. It's... Well, I think it could be today. You know, it, it, it's not a prophetic thing that makes the Lord have to come back before or after it. It's just an event. And we'll see that in the future, why I personally believe Russia could invade Israel at any time. It could invade them tonight. And all of you that, that worry about petroleum prices wouldn't have to worry anymore. Boy, they'd go up quick, you know. One invasion of Russia into the Middle East would cause skyrocketing petroleum prices. But let the nations be waked. And let them come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations round about. You see why? God says the center of the world to him is Jerusalem. That's a fascinating thought. The center of the world is Jerusalem. We'll cover that more later. Um, on down, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion. That's what Jerusalem is called, the hill of Zion. Utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Now, you're in Joel. Keep going to the right to Zechariah. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Boy, we're covering new ground. Some of you haven't ever been back here. It's really nice back here. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12. And these Old Testament prophets read better than a news service on the Internet. They are not commenting on past events. They are graphically displaying future events. And Zechariah 12.2 says this, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people round about. See the graphic here? Look at the shock waves going out into uh, the, the three continents surrounding Europe and Asia and Africa. It's just shock waves going out up there. What is that? Jerusalem is the cup of trembling. God has said, I have chosen to put my name on Jerusalem. Did you know Jerusalem has been destroyed 46 times? 
already. It's going to be destroyed one more time right here, the last time. God says it's going to be a shock felt around the whole planet. When they shall lay siege against Judah, Zechariah 12, 2, and against Jerusalem. And, and again, remember that all the, the convergence, uh, the nations of the east come in. Uh, you can see how they would come across. Uh, the Antichrist comes from the north. The southern kingdom comes up. We'll see that in just a moment in Daniel. Okay, Zechariah 14, just over two uh, chapters. Zechariah 14, look at verse 2. God says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Satan thinks he's doing it. Remember, he lets out the three frog demons. They come up out of the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet, out of the, the unholy trinity of Satan. And, and they go out and deceive the world and bring them. But who's really doing it? Zechariah 14, 2. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be taken. The houses rifled. The women ravished. Half the city will go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord shall go forth, uh, verse 12, and fight against those nations as he fought, or excuse me, verse 3, in the day of battle. Now verse 12, and this shall be the plague, uh, look at this, which the Lord will smite all the peoples who have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will consume away while they stand on their feet. Isn't that amazing? And their eyes shall consume away into their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. Amazing. Amazing. The total destruction. Now back to Revelation. Look at chapter 14. Armageddon is mentioned three times in the book of Revelation. We'll look at all those too. Revelation 14, first mentions in verse 14 of chapter 14. Revelation 14, 14. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having in his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle. Remember, sickle and harvest is always speaking of judgment. Pray the Lord of harvest, he send forth reapers, is saying, before he harvests the world with his judgment, go out and win the lost. Uh, harvest is always a, a picture of judgment. It's, it, remember, they harvest and they throw the, the tares into the furnace and they keep the, the good. And, and that's always a metaphor of judgment. So this is a metaphor, a picture of, of judgment. And he's sitting, the Lord Jesus is sitting on this cloud. He has his crown and a sharp sickle showing the final judgment is coming. Another angel came out of the temple, I'm reading 14 to 20, and crying with a loud voice to him that sat in the cloud, saying, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. The time has come for thee to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat in the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had the power over fire. And cry with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Ah, do you remember Basra and jumping up and down on the grapes? That's an Old Testament. Remember, the book of Revelation has only 404 verses, but it has 800 quotations and allusions to all the other parts of the Bible. It quotes all just amazingly from from all the different parts of the Bible, the, the law and the prophets and the Torah, in just quotes. And here's a, a quote from the prophets where it says, the, the um, grapes are fully ripe, just like in, in Isaiah 63. And the angel, continuing to read, thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. That's an Isaiah 63 picture of Jesus jumping up and down, squeezing the grapes. It's the same concept, same God, same judgment promised talking about the wrath of God because God is holding back his wrath right now. It, it says that he's, he is not giving us what we deserve, this planet. For us, the wrath of God is removed by the blood of Christ, but for the planet, for all the injustices, remember I talked about that this morning, don't waste your time trying to get vengeance on all the political shenanigans going on. They've gone on throughout all time ad infinitum, ad nauseum, but we don't get even, we, we just wait. And God's wrath will come full-blown onto this earth and look at the wine press was trodden outside the city, that's Jerusalem, and blood came out of the wine press even to the horses' bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. That's where we get this, this 200 mile long battlefield. Now it does not say that the blood is as high as a horse's bridle for 200 miles. All the blood of all the people alive on the planet right now would fit in Central Park 50 feet deep in New York City. If you squeezed everybody's blood out, everybody, all six billion people, and got it to New York City, and it didn't coagulate, it would just sit inside of Central Park 50 feet deep. There's not that much blood on the whole planet to speak of. We 
get along with not very much, amazingly. But what it's talking about is it's going to be flowing on the ground, and as a horse is tromping through with its hoofs, it will splash up to the height of a bridle. That means there's going to be enough. It'll be like puddles splashing, and that speaks again of this uh, long battlefield. Okay, now look at chapter 16, where we read earlier, verse 16. It says, and they gathered them together, these three infernal, unholy trinity uh, demons, to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And now look at chapter 19. Here's the glorious finale to all this. Revelation 19, starting in verse 11. I saw heaven opened. Remember, John is seeing all this. I, I mean, it's like a, a divine um, travelogue. He's just, he's transported and he sees the future as if it was happening at that very moment. And scientists that are really into physics say it's very possible that if God is, as the Bible describes him, beyond time, that to God, the past, the present, and the future are all happening at the same time. If you think about it, it's very amazing to think about somebody outside of time, outside of space, outside of He's a spirit, and he's above all that, and so he could actually be looking on, and, and uh, it says he inhabits inter eternity. He inhabits all of time. That must mean he can see it all at once. And so somehow John got to come back and see it as God saw it, and he looks, and he could see the, he could see the present and the future. Um, couldn't really see the past, but he saw the present and the future all going on at once. Maybe he saw the past too, but he doesn't comment on it. He just sees all that at once, and he sees in one setting events that were taking place right then and all the way into the future. And right here in verse 11, he saw heaven opened. Now, it could very well be he sees the actual second coming because it hasn't happened yet. But he was seeing it as it happened because he was standing in the presence of God who sees everything at once. Now, those people that really think about this, you know what they say? They say that everyone will get to heaven at the same time. That's an interesting thought because we'll all enter eternity at the same time, even though we left in physical time at different times, we all arrive at the same time. The Bible doesn't go into all that, so it's just interesting and not very profitable to speculate on it. But he's somehow seeing events, and I don't believe God showed it to him it's going to happen again. I believe he saw it as it was happening. That's the wonder of Revelation. We're actually seeing not a mock run. This is not a staging. This is the event. And he sees it. Heaven open, and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Same thing we saw in chapter 1. On his head were many crowns. That's why we sing crown him with many crowns. Although we can't crown him, he's already crowned. And on his name, a name written that no man knew but himself. That speaks of his intimacy. He, he reveals himself to us. And, and eternal life is knowing God personally. It's not saying, I prayed some when I was six years old. It's knowing God today, intimately. He says, he has this intimate name that only those who are born again know. They know him personally as their shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, he said. And his clothing, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. There's the Isaiah 63 idea. It's dipped in the blood of, of judgment. But also, it's speaking of the lamb slain for the sins of the world. It's his garment. So there's two ideas here. It's the blood, his own blood shed. It's also, he's got blood on his garments because uh, it, it shows his judgment as he tramples the, uh, the grapes of his wrath against humanity and their sin. And his name was called the Word of God. And look at this. The armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses and when Enoch saw this event, by the way, Enoch comments on this. Remember Enoch, the, the seventh from Adam that didn't die like Elijah and he was translated to heaven? He prophesied of this event and he says, Behold, the Lord cometh with hundreds of millions of his saints. Now Enoch saw that back in the pre-flood world. And he saw when the heavens break open and the King of kings and Lord of lords comes through, faithful and true, riding. It says here, the armies of heaven followed him and their horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And Enoch said there are hundreds of millions of them. That's why every time I take a group to the Holy Land and they stand at, at Megiddo and we look at Armageddon at the top end, the north side of it, and we look down the valley toward, toward the whole stretch to Jerusalem, I say, some of you will never again come here with me. The next time you come to Israel, you're going to come on a horse. 
you know, and they all chuckle, and I say, and you're going to come in the sky. And all of a sudden, our minds are drawn to this very passage because this is our return behind Jesus Christ, his redeemed. We are part of the armies of heaven. He is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. We are his servants, and we come riding behind him, watching this battle, and it's a very um, little battle. I mean, all of the armies of the world, uh, some have said as many as 400 million troops. If you got everybody armed, all the militias and all the, you know, the, the people that are the, the weekend warriors, you got the whole crowd and all of, you know, just about everybody in Iran or Iraq and Iran are in the army. You know, you get them all there with their stuff. You get about 400 million soldiers right in that bullseye up there. And the Lord comes and look what he does. No guns, no it says, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he shall tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath in his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, by the way, all the migration of 60% of all the scavenger birds in the world every year those birds crisscross all of Asia and Europe's scavenger birds come down the Jordan Rift and roost for the winter in Africa and they come back and go back home and they just fly back and forth right over Israel just waiting for the feast that's coming and then interesting that God made all those carrion fly right over and he's going to call them all together and he's going to say gather to the supper of the great God, that you may come eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, the flesh of men, both free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, by which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that had worshipped the image. And these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Wow. What, what is the sword that he speaks? The word of God. What do you have in your hands tonight? The word of God. The same sword that will defeat all the armies of the earth is the same sword that you can defeat the deceiver, the doubt producer, the one who seeks to accuse us before God, Satan and his minions and it's the same sword that can render powerless our flesh did you know most of us have never been bothered by a demon and far less bothered by Satan but we're deeply distraught by our own flesh and the same sword that will someday destroy 400 plus million soldiers you're holding in your hand tonight and God says that this book shall not depart out of our mouth but we should meditate in it day and night and to the degree that the church of Jesus Christ meditates on this book is to the degree that you and I experience the peace of God that passes understanding in a deteriorating world. It's to the degree that we experience the holiness of God and the righteousness of God in this present evil age. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth, which you've got. I hope you brought one tonight. I hope you read it this week will triumph through us, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, we've seen it tonight. One little word will fell him. You struggling with something? Anger, wrath, malice, evil communication, lust, bitterness from something in the past? One word of God's word can fell, can destroy the power hold of that sin over your life and my life.